All right, please cover your left eye and read the third line on the eye chart. Ready? Go. Two questions. Did you get TOZ? And don't you feel like something from south of the border? These are questions advertisers and psychologists have considered for decades, trying to figure out what the eye can see. Or if the message appears too quickly to see, does the mind still subliminally process the content of it? In 1957, a market researcher named James Vickery announced he had boosted popcorn sales by more than 50% at a New Jersey movie theater. All he had to do was flash the message eat popcorn on screen for one three thousandth of a second, well below the threshold of what the human eye can see, every few seconds. Vickery called it subliminal advertising. Audiences got upset. There were claims of brainwashing. Congress tried to ban the secret messages, but were they really working? The next year, in 1958, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation blinked the words Telephone Now 352 times on a half-hour TV show. The results? Some Canadians said the show made them want to drink beer, some said it made them have to go to the bathroom, but not one viewer guessed what the message said. And telephone use did not increase during or immediately after the show. Subliminal messages were bunk, psychologists said. A weak stimulus has a weak response. At best, the messages were like a tiny ad you half glimpse while flipping through the pages of a magazine. Vickery, the popcorn salesman, was unable to replicate his study under scrutiny, and later he admitted he had falsified the data in his first experiment. Did this mark the end of the hidden message? Hardly. Undergrad psych majors still take up the topic. Several companies have been charged with slipping the word sex into their ads. And the board game Husker Du buried the phrase get it into a commercial for the game in the 70s. But subliminal messaging wasn't just for sneaky advertisers. In recent years, with the dawn of digital media and frame-by-frame -frame playback, cartoons, especially from Disney, have been accused of being, shall we say, naughty? Take your pick. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, or The Lion King, or The Little Mermaid, or the 1999 recall of a few million copies of The Rescuers for a two-frame topless scene? It seemed like America's number one schmaltz merch and it has a blue streak. And they aren't alone. In the 1940s, an animator named Seamus Culhane, known for his work on Woody the Woodpecker, put out a cartoon called The Greatest Man in Siam, full of images straight out of your middle school sex ed class. And sometimes there wasn't a message so much as a new spectacle. On a few occasions, Culhane used Woody the Woodpecker as a canvas for modern art. An animation professor combing over Culhane's Woody Woodpecker creations has found several second-long explosion scenes that resemble the work of the abstract expressionists. In The Loose Nut, the hyperactive woodpecker drives the steamroller into a woodshed, setting up a scene that could have been illustrated by Jackson Pollock or Franz Klein. Speaking of some of his buried imagery, Culhane said, We were just trying to put one over on them. So if you're catching your first glimpse of modern art with the Saturday morning cartoons, does that make it a subliminal art history lecture? Whatever, let's go get tacos.